Hi, everyone. Well, what a world we're living in. Some good news on my end. I finally got to go and get a haircut. And I also got to start back with my personal trainer. So I feel like my life is immeasurably improved. But today I want to talk to you about what you don't know that you don't know. So with recent events as a black woman and also as a physician, I have felt the need to speak out in alignment with the protesters after George uh, Floyd's death and the death of so many others um, of the devastating impact of racism in our country. Now, as a mother, I can't even say how heartbroken I am for the mothers of the, um, you know, George Floyd, Floyd, Ahmad, uh, Arbery, uh, Breonna, and all the other people who have been uh, murdered by the police. I'm heartbroken as a mother. And, you know, I've lost one of my own children, my middle son who died at a, as a result of his mental illness. And his birthday was just last week. So I know what it's like to lose a child. And I can't even imagine how much more painful it is when your child is shot or killed because of the color of his skin. So on a human level, I feel like we're all being called to recognize that this ongoing oppression of Black Americans and other people of color, Native Americans, uh, Latinx, um, it hurts not just people of color, not just Black people, but it hurts people in other marginalized communities, some of whom are like you, dealing with food and body image issues and have experienced this kind of bias because of your size. But more than that, it hurts all Americans. Um, it hurts our standing in the world. It hurts how we feel about ourselves and each other. It, it divides us it, and it unites us as we're seeing in the, in the protest. So we have an opportunity to move beyond the politics, to dig deeper into our hearts, to stand in our humanity, to take the changes, to make the changes that have impacted all of us, to change this climate of racism that has impacted all of us. Um, I just wanted to tell you, you know, even though I am Black, African American, um, I've been trying to keep up with the news. I've been trying to educate myself. I think we all have uh, biases, whether they come from our culture or they come from our families. Um, so it's important for each and every one of us to look inside and see where we are biased. So one of the resources I've been, I just wanted to share with you is this book by Ibram Kendi, how not to be uh, or how to be an anti-racist, and he he defines racism in his book as one who is supporting a racist policy through their actions or inaction, or express, expressing a racist idea. And he's saying it's not enough to just say I'm not a racist. It's important to stand against racism. And that, that is what makes you an anti-racist. An anti-racist he defines as one who is supporting an anti-racist policy through their actions or expressing an anti-racist idea. This is a really important book and I think it's gonna be part of what changes um, the culture up around racism. So I encourage you to, to read it. On kind of a weird side note, I've also uh, recently watched the um, TV show on Netflix called Little Fires Everywhere with Kerry Washington from Scandal fame, yay, and also Reese Witherspoon. And while that's, uh, that series is all about motherhood, that's for sure, it's also all about race and class. And one of the things that I was so impressed about, about the, uh, the TV series, Little Fires Everywhere, is how clearly they were able to demonstrate uh, racial abuse in our culture. So we used to call those microaggressions, you know, where you are uh, 
say you're on a bus and you're a black person and, and there's an empty seat next to you and nobody takes the seat or you have your purse next to you and someone sits down and you grab it and hold it as if, you know, the implication is as if someone might steal it. So all of these microaggressions happen on a regular basis, often by very well intended people, people, people who would describe themselves as not a racist. And that's why I said on a human level, we have to dig deeper into our hearts, become more aware of all the areas in which we either unwittingly or on purpose or unconsciously um, practice racial abuse. So uh, I, I also read a, a wonderful interview with John Stewart, who used to be the host of The Daily Show, and it was in the New York Times. And he's talking about how this time in our history is not just about the police. And I think that's so important for all of us to recognize. He says in his interview, the police are a reflection of a society. They're not a rogue alien organization that came down to torment the black community. They're enforcing segregation. Segregation is legally over, but it never ended. The police are in some respects a border patrol and they patrol the border between the two Americas. We have that so that the rest of us don't have to deal with it. Then that situation erupts and we express our shock and indignation. But if we don't address the anguish of a people, the pain of being a people who built this country through forced labor or slavery, people say, I'm tired of everything being about race. Well, imagine how exhausting it is to live that. So I love how John Stewart phrased that. And I think it's so important for us to, again, just broaden our perspectives, become more aware, search in our hearts. See, many of us have benefited from the system that, uh, that started slavery. Many of us have benefited from these biases. So just acknowledging that we need to come clean and cleanse and heal our country. All of us have biases, whether they're explicit or implicit. Now, many people are now, especially our young people who I'm so proud of, are now waking up to the need to understand and acknowledge all aspects of bias and racism. It's not enough to say, I'm not a racist. Just as Zindi Kendi says in his book, it's important to be an anti-racist. So one of the ways in which biases are explored is, is, uh, or expressed is something called implicit bias. And I'm sure most of you have heard about that by now, but it exists when people unconsciously hold attitudes towards others or associate stereotypes with them. So I'm gonna talk about how that affects people living in larger bodies in just a moment. But to clarify, implicit bias can form about race, age, sexual orientation, weight, and so much more. Now, Vox News, that's Vox with a V as in Victor, says you can think of implicit bias as thoughts about people you didn't know you had, okay? So racist beliefs are any beliefs, thoughts, or actions that cause inequity or in which you can see or uh, perceive one person or a group of people as inferior to another. Now, while it's normal to have biases, they become harmful when they cause us to act unfairly towards a client, uh, a student of ours, or a patient, or a, a friend, or someone in our classroom, et cetera, someone in your community. So those of you who are living in larger bodies may experience implicit bias due to weight, right? Due to size, and that's weight stigma. Implicit bias can keep us from understanding and relating to people who are not like us. Or that's what we tell ourselves. They're not, they're not like us. Sorry, my air quotes were a little too early there. Um, that's part of the bias of thinking of another group as their other, they're the other, they're not like us. Some other ways in which implicit bias can show up, um, especially regarding 
living in larger bodies. Uh, the research shows that sadly, medical professionals are the number two source of implicit bias and weight stigma, often ignoring overall medical issues while over-focusing on weight. So you may be wondering who's the number one source of, of uh, weight stigma, and that would be family members. Again, very sad. So an, a research has also showed that there is implicit bias in the assumption that many people in society have that people living in larger bodies, and this is the stereotype, right? Uh, people living in larger bodies are lazy, not active, or not as intelligent, which of course is not true. And this impacts job opportunities, educational opportunities, and so much more. And finally, research has shown um, that obese children are more likely to be assumed by teachers to be less intelligent than slim children. So if you're a person who, who's not a person of color, but you're living in a larger body, hopefully you can use your experience of being discriminated against to help you understand the broader and um, more pervasive racial discrimination that happens in our, and racial oppression and racial abuse that happens in our country. So getting back to weight bias, implicit weight bias has gone up from 75 to 81 percent of respondents in one study showing a bias against heavier people. If you think of how implicit bias relating to size may have affected you or people you care about, then you have some idea again of how implicit racial bias or even bias uh, along sexual orientation may feel. But implicit bias can be changed. Uh, here are some things to think about. Simply having contact with people about whom you have bias can reduce the bias. Now, that does not mean that you go out looking for a token black friend to have so that you can learn what it's like to have a black friend. It also doesn't mean that you, if you ha already have black friends, that you ask them to explain all the racial bias and racial oppression that's happened in the world since slavery and make them, the, again, the token black who has all the knowledge about all black people. So it's really just allowing yourself to not turn away from opportunities where you may be able to interact with people who are uh, different color, different size, you know, et cetera. The second thing is to educate yourself. Now I've listed in the show notes, some resources. I've also showed you the book that I'm currently reading. I told you about the Netflix series, Little Fires Everywhere. Sorry, that's not on Netflix, that's on Hulu. Sorry about that. So, and there's plenty of articles now in the news look at different news sources, don't just stick to one, and educate yourself about what it means to be biased, what racial oppression is, what has the, been the impact of slavery on the United States, how, how slaves built this country. Number three, considering contrasting viewpoints and recognizing multiple perspectives can reduce automatic implicit bias. So that's again why I recommend that you check out different news sources, not just one that you always look at. So I, I recently saw a sign that a, a protester who happened to be uh, white had, and she said it was something like, if my son had gone out jogging and was killed for no other reason than the color of his skin, I'd be pissed off too. So I like that because, again, that's showing that she's able to at least try to put herself in someone else's shoes and understand the pain that people are experiencing right now. But awareness is really not enough. Implicit bias makes it acceptable to discriminate against people for race and size, sexual orientation, age, and abilities. So what, find your group that you identify with and use your own experiences of being um, discriminated against or being uh, stigmatized because of your size or your sexual orientation to help understand what it's like to uh, 
deal with the all day, every day racial abuse and discrimination that um, Black Americans go through. So just remember, if there isn't justice for all, there won't be justice for anyone. This is the work of recovery, and it's the work of recovery, recovering our country. I don't know if we've ever had an unbiased country, but I know that our founding fathers may have envisioned something like that, and hopefully we're able to make the kind of changes that can unite us as a people. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.